Um, olá e bem-vindos a mais uma conferência um, Eutopos. Desta vez o nosso orador é Richard Charkin. Um, Richard Charkin é, é editor há mais de 50 anos, uh, foi presidente da Associação Internacional de Editores e, 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 e editor, diretor executivo da Bloomsbury entre 2017 e 2018. E atualmente é presidente da Bloomsbury China e da John Wisden um, e é editor e diretor e fundador da Mensch Publishing, uma pequena editora. Um, hoje traz-nos uma história e é de alguma forma a sua história sobre livros e o futuro deles e pronto, e veremos como é que isto se relaciona com Eutopos. No fim, depois teremos espaço para perguntas e que isso vim, não estou a ver agora, mas acho que acredito que está lá atrás. Um, Richard, welcome and thank you so much. Well, good evening. Um, I think there are. Sorry, is it working? Okay. There are many scary things in this world. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I was here in Lisbon. My school put on a production of Othello, uh, and we ran, I think, seven performances. And I was the understudy for Iago, um, which meant I had to know the words, but I never got to perform them. So every evening, I was scared out of my mind. So that was scary. Um, second thing is, that's scary, is to address a distinguished group of people on a subject with a subject heading that, to be honest, I don't quite understand. <laughs> Francisco has tried to explain it to me many times, uh, even how to pronounce it, utopos, I think. Um, and I'm going to do my best to see if I have understood even 5%. And the third most scary thing is when you've got an audience like this and one of them is your wife of 52 years <laughs> who, who knows everything and I can see her rolling her eyes as I come out with some piece of nonsense. So forgive me for my nerves. Um, I also have to add that I, I think I'm here slightly under false pretenses, because I'm neither a philosopher, nor a scholar, nor a literary lion, nor a Jesuit. Uh, it's true, I've written one book, which has taken me 74 years to get round to. Um, it's called My Back Pages After, a, it's an allusion to a Bob Dylan song which uh, I recommend you look up the YouTube version with superstars playing it. It's very wonderful. Um, but I'm not an author, really. I'm a publisher. I've been a publisher for 52 years, just about the same time as Sue and I got married. Um, when I wrote this book, and Madalena is just looking after me perfectly, um, This book came about because I give talks to MA students studying publishing at various universities in London and in Oxford. And um, I, I'm not a lecturer, so I just tell stories. And the stories are about publishing and about how it's changed. And, And I won't exaggerate, but maybe two or three people came up to me and said, you know you should write it down. And I said, no, three reasons. One is, I'm lazy. Two, I've forgotten most of the things I ever knew. And three, the world does not need another book by a self-aggrandizing publisher of no little merit. That seemed to be the case, and I was quite happy with that, until one of our daughters um, mentioned 
the idea of me doing a book to a friend, a family friend, and the next thing I knew, I was sitting down in a, actually a pub, um, and sometimes a cafe, with this young man who's a novelist, and I would just tell stories, and he'd make notes, and the next thing we knew, we had 60,000 words, which is my definition of a book. Um, we made a few rules at the beginning, and this does slightly relate to Utopos, um, that we wouldn't, or I wouldn't, we wouldn't malign individuals. There are a few reasons for that. The first is I didn't want to get into trouble or be sued, um, which might have been the case. Uh, also, I didn't want to lose friends. Uh, you can malign somebody, you know, you say something about someone which appears to be malignant, but actually you're friends. So, didn't want to do it for that reason. And also, I don't actually think that good and evil uh, in a single person, they can coexist. Um, there was recently a film, which I don't know whether it's been released here, called One Life. And it's the story of an English stockbroker at the, just before the Second World War broke out, who heard about um, many Jewish children in Prague who would probably be wiped out if they weren't rescued. And he, at some risk to himself and a lot of effort, arranged to have 600 of these kids out. He didn't get them all out, and he, was, and he didn't get any fame or any acclaim for this act. Um, then, 30 years later, one of his colleagues from the Prague days had kept a scrapbook, which he gave to this chap. He was called Nicholas Winton. And Nicholas Winton showed this scrapbook to a scholar in Oxford called Betty Maxwell, uh, who was organizing a conference on the Holocaust, so he thought she would be interested. She was. She showed it to her husband, who was a man called Robert Maxwell, who at the time owned the biggest tabloid, I think the biggest tabloid in Europe, called the Daily Mirror. He was so taken with this story that he himself wrote an editorial. This editorial was picked up by a very big mass market TV show and they invited Mr. Winton along to tell the story of his saving of the 600 people. There was an extraordinary moment when he's sitting in the front row of the audience and one by one, the people stand up and they were the people he'd saved who had never known him up to this point. They were very, very moving. And the point of this story is that this Robert Maxwell was my boss in 1974. He was an absolute ogre. <laughs> he was a despot. He was a bully. He ended up floating in the Mediterranean, having fallen off his private yacht. Uh, he had stolen the pension fund of his employees. He is uh, in the, all the reference books, he's described as a crook, a rogue, and less polite words. And yet, in this person, who I, incidentally I respected as a publisher, he was a brilliant publisher, but not as a person. But this person did one good thing. 
he made this other man, Nicholas Winton, was rewarded for the great things he had done in the war. So I think I didn't want to malign anyone in the book because even Robert Maxwell had a good side, and so we haven't maligned anyone. Um, well, actually, there's one person who's so well and truly dead, I, I was able to just lift a little bit. Um, anyway, we wrote the book. We didn't know where it was going to go. I had no idea what... But I thought it would be interesting to see what changes had happened in the industry in which I've worked. Um, and I'm very lucky in that I've worked in most of the continents of the world. I've worked in fiction, in children's, in scientific journals, in scholarly books, in digital, in databases, in startups, privately owned, publicly owned, unowned, disowned companies. Um, ones that went bust and ones that did quite well. Um, so I thought maybe there was a perspective here that... So I'll come to some of the conclusions first. Um, the, can you imagine, here we are in rainy Lisbon, but let's imagine rainy London, 1972, and I applied to, for a job in various places. I was 23 at the time, I suppose. Um, and I had, my hair was different. Uh, well, there's a picture there, you won't be able to see it. Anyway, um, uh, closer to Bob Dylan than whatever I look like now. Um, and this, this company was called George Harrop. It was famous only, really, for its French dictionary, French, English, English, French dictionary. The rest of the business was there to, I don't know, just be there. They hired me as a science editor for no good reason, apart from I had a degree in science, but that was, that was it. Um, and I turn up. So there was 60 people in the business, I'm guessing. It was in the middle of London, in High Hoban. And the whole business was there. The warehouse was there, the invoicing, the finance. Well, there was no finance. Um, there was no IT either. Um, and if you wanted to know how many copies of books sold, you would first of all go to the production department and say, how many did we print? You'd go to the publicity person, say, how many did you give away? And then you go down to the warehouse and ask the guy how many we had left. And after sophisticated quadratic equations, you had, you had the sales. So that's what it was like. Um, it was... A few noticeable things. Uh, first of all, there were no women in senior positions whatsoever. The most senior was a publicity assistant and a few editorial assistants, um, but that was it. The, the directors were all white, obviously, men, obviously, of a particular class. Um, many of them had the same surname, which was Harrop, unsurprisingly. Um, and we had to call him Mr. Paul or Mr. Ian or Mr. whatever, Walter, because um, otherwise it would be very confusing. Um, we'd go to the pub down the road. It was called the Princess Louise. It's still there. Um, and there would be a class divide. There was the public bar where common people went, and the lounge bar where the posh people went. In the public bar, you drank beer, and in the lounge bar, you drank gin and tonic. Uh, very, very clear divide. Um, I was in the sort of interesting position that because I had a degree from a reasonable university, and I was doing so, no one knew where I fitted, which is very good place to be, I might say. Um, we all smoked. Uh, we smoked in our office, everywhere. Um, we also, or many of us, had company cars. Because this was a time when Britain was going through one of its regular economic crises. High inflation, stagflation, uh, and 
government controlled prices and incomes. So if you wanted to change the price of a book, you had to write to a government department for permission. And if you wanted to give someone a pay rise, you had to write to a government department for permission. So it was very hard to give people pay rises. So they gave you cars instead. It's one of the, one of the things I've learned in life, that however hard governments try to control things, they usually fail because people are more intelligent by and large than governments. Um, so, so we all have, well, many of us had cars. Even I was 24, 23, 24 years old, I had a company car. That's inconceivable today. Um, and more, more importantly than that, now something like 70, 75% of all employees in publishing houses in what I call the Anglosphere, it may be different in Russia and it may be different, I uh, say, so are women. And something like 60 to 70% of all directors are women. And a very high proportion of top CEOs in publishing are women. And it's been an undiluted good. Um, not so great for the second rate men who no longer get up the ladder, but you know, there's always winners and losers in these things. Um, so these were social changes. And I don't think any much different in other industries, but it was very pronounced in ours. Um, I suppose the other thing that's different is we all drank at lunchtime, alcohol that is, not, not sparkling. The sparkling water hadn't been invented, I think. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so we drank beer, and you would have three or four pints of beer before going back to work, and it was completely normal. And quite often, the directors at least would be asleep at their desks by three o'clock. Um, we, we, we didn't, um, I remember when the first computer was put in, and we had no idea what the point of it was, except we suspected that it was there to check that we hadn't been fiddling our expenses. That seemed to be the only explanation of why you'd have a computer, although how it would have done that, I don't know. So, but that was the first technology that came into the industry. And the other story, apart from the social changes, of course, is technology. Um, publishing is an industry to a large extent based on fear the fear of change, the fear of things happening to you. So when radio first came on the scene, I, am, I wasn't around. The publishers, I'm certain, were going, oh no, this is it. This, who's going to want to read a book when they can listen to a book? And then TV. Of course, alongside all this were other means of reading, the newspapers, for instance. And at every turn, we were terrified. Except, and ironically, the industry has adapted to every single one. And every single competitive challenge or technology shift has been dealt with to the benefit of the industry, and they don't always see it this way, but to authors and readers. Of course, every author thinks his publisher is doing a lousy job. Every reader thinks that they're paying too much for the book, and anyway, it was too hard to get. And, uh, but the truth is that, actually, it's been a very adaptable and um, energetic and entrepreneurial industry. Um, so, these technologies, I, when I started, we typeset the books in hot metal, uh, lead, I think, incredibly expensive. Um, I think my first book I published, say, in 1973, um, it was £10 a page. In today's money to typeset, in today's money, that's 60 pounds a page, which is 
what, 80 euros a page. So um, a 300 page book, I can't do the maths on my head. It's a lot. And every correction was a pound, which is like, so it made, we had to make sure that the copy editing was as good as it could be because making corrections was so expensive. Well, big change. Everyone now says, all right, well, we'll fix it later because it's easy enough to do. And typesetting is now cheap. Um, I'm going to talk about the internet briefly. I, it's very hard to get this chronologically because they all, these overlapped and things. But the first one I'll take is internet. So I don't know when the internet was formed, but it didn't take long before academics and scholars in particular, and it started in universities, started communicating through the internet, and publishers sort of vaguely became aware that there was something happening here, uh, which was to do with communication, was to do with scholars talking to each other. So the first impact of, of the internet was very much in agriculture, academic publishing, and specifically in scientific, technical, and medical publishing, and specifically in the publication of research results. Um, well, there was a problem. The publication of scientific research was a highly profitable industry. In fact, invented by this ogre, Robert Maxwell, he, he invented really the, the new model. The new model was you charge an arm and a leg for a journal subscription to roughly a thousand libraries around the world and on average you, you bill them for a million dollars and this gives you a billion dollar business. You don't pay the editors, you don't pay the contributors uh, and you keep all the money yourself. It was a terrific, terrific business model. Uh, the internet rather put it, well, it didn't put an end to it, absolutely, but it certainly challenged the industry. Um, and there were two choices. One is you fight it. You don't put your data up on the internet because there were people who say, as soon as you put that stuff up there, someone will steal it. Well, it's true. They do. Um, but if you don't put it up at all, you don't have a business, so there was no choice. The, um, so in the mid-90s, academic publishers woke up to the fact they had to do something. And they, no one was quite sure what to do. Uh, the only thing that was certain was that librarians in universities still had a budget and they weren't going to hand that budget back to the university very easily. They quite like to keep it. Um, so at least we knew there was a budget to buy things. Um, but what we didn't have was platforms and how to sell and, and all the rest of it. And this changed. We had, there were enormous rows. How do you do it? How don't you do it? And, um, and eventually, something called the site license was invented, which is a university can subscribe to a journal and everyone on campus has access free at the point of use. And to give you a, a number on that, um, in the late 90s, I, I was running a company called Macmillan, whose greatest asset was a journal called Nature. And we calculated that pre-internet, the cost of reading a single paper in Nature was around $5. And that was calculated by the price that the librarian paid for the journal, divided by how many people, etc. $5. Post uh, creating our platform, the cost fell to 50 cents, a 10 times reduction. 
Now, we were quite happy because the volume went through the roof. The circulation of nature in print was 60,000, and within a year, we had 2 million users on the internet. So uh, we were quite happy, um, and the customers were actually quite happy at the time until they thought they could get a better deal. The better deal was not 10 cents, it was zero, which is what uh, they're pushing for now. Um, I'll come back to that particular theme. Um, around the same time as this was happening, uh, a, a company in Seattle was set up uh, called Amazon. And I, I do remember the first time I heard of it and that they'd bought, it was a new customer and that they'd paid 2,000 pounds for some books. Ah, not so terrible, 2,000 was better than nothing. Um, but I had no idea of the impact that Amazon was going to have on our industry in, in just about every respect. Um, so right now, Amazon is by far the biggest uh, retailer of print books worldwide, of e-books, of audio books, of second-hand books, and of antiquarian books. Um, well, they do it very well. So unintended consequences, for instance, um, one profitable aspect of publishing used to be um, textbooks to students in the United States, college textbooks, Biology 101, Economics 101, that kind of thing. You'd get big adoptions and you'd sell in the first year 10,000 copies. The second year you wouldn't sell 10,000 because some of the students would recycle their books, but you'd sell 7,000. By year three, it would be 2,000, and in year four, you'd produce a new edition to make the previous ones obsolete. This was, this was the model. Unfortunately, it turns out that Amazon was so brilliant at recycling textbooks that you only sold 10,000 in year one, and that was the end of it. And you couldn't do a new edition every year, so so um, companies, there's a big company called Pearson, who was by far the biggest in that, their share price slumped, um, and various others. So that was, we would never have been able to predict that particular aspect. Um, of course, we didn't know about e-books, so we couldn't have predicted that. And audio books were such a pain in the neck, with tapes and things, and falling apart, and, and generally, that we tried not to we pretended they didn't exist. Um, and antiquarian books was outside our ken, but it was um, amazing impact. Strange thing about Amazon is that they are in an utterly dominant position. And normally, um, companies in utterly dominant position, I won't use the word beginning with M, but it's close to that, um, usually uh, they use that dominant position to abuse their suppliers. Now, Amazon isn't a gentle giant, but equally, it doesn't actually push as hard as, don't quote me, but they, <laughs> they, it's surprising that they haven't given their dominant position, haven't done more, and, and that's, this is really important because the, if they did more, authors would get less. That's the only movable bit in this, in this equation. So um, I'm sort of relieved and, and, and delighted. And so they're, they're my enemy in one respect, and in another respect, they're our friend. So uh, we learn to live with it, and I suppose that's a, another form of utopos somewhere between distru uh, dystopia and utopia. Um, the utopian bit of Amazon is that if back in 1997, someone had said to me, you know what, 
your books you publish for your authors will be available in every country in the world within 24 hours of them placing an order, or actually a nanosecond if they buy an e-book, I would say you're crazy. Um, but if it's true, that is utopian. Um, well, it's not quite utopian, but it's definitely not dystopian either. So I leave that thought with you. Um, then I'm gonna turn back to this thing. Another thing that came out of social change and technology was that in some way it was morally superior for information to be free rather than paid for. Um, when I started, um, if you paid to have your book published, it was considered rather substandard, uh, not, not quite, you know, you're just doing it for your own image and, and the rest of it. But that's changed as people expect information to be free. Um, well, you know, our industry is not based on information being free. Our, our industry is based on people one way or another paying for information. Now, certainly there are free newspapers. Well, you know who's paying for them. It's you, it's your eyeballs, which are being sold to the advertisers. But in, in books and journals, it's, 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 it's harder. Um, but there is a very strong movement, particularly again in the academic community, that information should be free. And, and look, there are good arguments why. If the taxpayer is paying for the research, why shouldn't that research be available to everyone free of charge? Um, there are, there's a, a moral downside, I think. Um, a, an old publishing colleague of mine, I remember talking about censorship in Russia. This was a long time ago, it's still going on. The main newspaper in Russia was Pravda. It was called The Truth. And the one thing, and it was almost free. You know, they gave it to anyone who would. They, and the one thing we know about Pravda is it didn't tell much truth. Um, and so his, his line was, you know, where information is free, there is little freedom of information. And I think the act of paying is that commercial thing is quite an important thing. The other thing is not so much a moral thing, it's a business thing, but in an open access community, uh, the author pays typically $1,000 to have a paper published in a scientific journal as opposed to the university paying to subscribe. Well, in a business sense, I'd rather collect a million dollars from a thousand universities than a thousand dollars from a million authors. And just the practicality of that, it just boggles the mind. And indeed, it's exact, but it's happening. Uh, when we say authors, it's largely the funding agencies paying, but nonetheless. And there is, so there's that. And then there's a third, which is a, a quality issue. However hard the editor of a journal tries to maintain quality, if they are judged by how many papers they publish, as opposed to how many papers are read, there will be a temptation to lower the bar on acceptances. And we've seen that happen. The number of acceptances of scientific papers has gone through the roof. Um, and not all from totally reputable institutions. And there's a lot of publishers right now struggling with the fact that they're discovering that the stuff they published was rubbish one way or another. And um, or indeed one, well, I won't go to it. There have been some real nasties in, in that area. Um, the latest 
technology, of course, is uh, artificial intelligence, which is boring the pants off everyone. This is a little book I got involved in, just trying to talk the history, how it came about. And, and from the title, Shimmer, Don't Shake, Don't Worry, this says don't worry, okay? There are some real worries, naturally. Again, there's no utopia, and I think nor dystopia, although one can write stories. I've, I picked out a quote here. This is from a, an anti-AI person called Griffith Mordant. I've no idea who he is, but what I do know is he got AI to write this bit. So. Um, ah, he says, the utopian dream of AI as the great educational equalizer and economic panacea. Let's not don rose-tinted glasses quite yet. AI, while potentially transformative, is an excellent breeding ground for systematic bias, inequity, and the amplification of existing socioeconomic disparities. We risk creating a world where those who program the algorithms dictate the futures of those who are governed by them. Moreover, jobs, the ones AI hasn't automated into oblivion, will require such skills that the chasm between the educated elite and the rest widens further. The economy might grow, but for whom? Yeah, I think, I think Mr. AI wrote a very good paragraph there. Uh, on the other hand, the author of this book writes, not only does AI liberate time, it also replaces an old equation that wisdom flows from learning and experience with new, instantly accessible general wisdom. Thought becomes more important than retention. For literature, this is exciting. Gen Z influencers and young leaders emerging in publishing will commission and enable assertive, innovative writing, asking fundamental questions about how Earth should revolve. New ideas expressed in original terms will flourish. It could be the new Renaissance. Well, maybe. Uh, do I believe that AI will create literary masterpieces making redundant the likes of Cervantes, uh, Saramago, Coelho, Rowling, and many others. No. The human cre creativity of their books in surpasses anything AI can develop. But do I think AI can replace and dislodge writers of safety manuals, revision guides, business primers, advertising copy, I mean, which is terrible, written by humans anyway, so can't be any worse. Uh, they'll do it better and cheaper. There will be job losses across our industry. Um, the understandable and not unrealistic fear among authors and their societies representing them is that copyright material will be purloined by large language model operators without payment and used to make the authors themselves redundant. Well, I don't know, in English last year, there were something like 300,000 new books. Now, I think you can look at that as being a good thing. It means there's a lot of creativity out there. But equally, if perhaps 250,000 of them were never published, it wouldn't be the end of the world either. Um, a, a, a negative which he doesn't mention there, which I feel anyway, is that AI has the power 
to aid governments in their attempts to censor. Uh, there seems to be a natural inclination, even among uh, Western democratic freedom of speech governments, to want to get a degree of control. Um, fortunately, at least I can speak for Britain, our government is so incompetent that it couldn't possibly find anyone breaching it, they, so they just have to let it go. Um, however, using artificial intelligence to identify every word that might be offensive to a government, and I'm thinking particularly of some of the totalitarian regimes, which I will not name uh, in Asia, uh, who are very good at this sort of thing and will use it to jump on freedom of expression, which I think is not good. So we have to fight for freedom of expression even harder now than ever before. Um, in a way, this is e-dystopia rather than utopia. A world deprived of writers who illuminate challenge and enrich our lives and the power to grant censorship to state agencies. However, we can use AI as we have other technologies over this last 50 years to make us do things better. Um, I think authors are quite right to complain at their publishers. We take too long, we pay too little, we don't listen to them enough. Um, I set up, uh, and I'm sorry, the reason that we don't do those things as well as we'd like to is we spend money and effort on repetitive tasks that frankly we do better not to have. I mean, I don't know about here in Portugal, but in the United States, it takes a year to publish a new novel at the very least. Because if you have, not because it takes that time to print or anything like that, but because you have to tell Barnes and Noble a year in advance for them to put it on their shelves. And they put it on their shelves for a week and then send it back if it hasn't sold. These are the realities of our business. And, and it, you know, that can change, we, we, and we must change it. Um, I, I set up a little company called Mensch Publishing. Mensch is also at a stretch, utopia, uh, utopos indeed. Um, Mensch means in German, a human being. Uh, in Yiddish, it means something slightly different. Well, first of all, it's non-gender specific. It applies to both men and women, and anything in between, incidentally. Um, and it means an upright and decent person, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, and the Oxford English Dictionary have enormous respect for it, but it's got it slightly wrong. It does mean upright and decent, but imperfect, because perfection would be very unhuman. You cannot be perfect. So Mensch contains a bit. So Mensch Publishing is meant to be upright and decent, but please, I get it wrong some of the time. I'm, I'm definitely not perfect. And the, the idea was that authors should be treated with the respect they deserve, and therefore, they should be able to speak to their publisher whenever they want. And when I say publisher, I mean publisher, the person who has paid and owns. And if it's a failure, is, is, it cops it. And if it's a success, it shares in the success with the author. So Mensch Publishing has only one employee, uh, and it's part-time, it's me. Uh, so I, I did it for that. I also did it because at the age of, I think I set it up four years ago, so I was 70. Um, I wanted to learn more. So I'd been in this industry for ages and ages, and I thought I was pretty good, but I didn't know everything, and I sure as hell didn't know everything. Every week that goes by, I learn something. 
and um, in an age, in an era where people are going to live longer, we should live better as well. And part of living better is to keep learning and keep discovering and keep doing new things. So that was the other reason. And thirdly, I wanted to prove that just because a book isn't a bestseller doesn't mean it's not commercially viable. Now, some of my books are not commercially viable, I have to tell you. Um, but overall, it is commercially viable because my overhead is very low. I do not pay advances against future royalties. All my authors get exactly the same terms. 25% if you want to know, 25% of any money I get goes to the author. Um, and I pick up all the other costs. Um, and, and they can all see the, each other's contracts and I'm not in the least bit worried about that. Uh, so that's a great relief to me. Um, and I publish quickly. Um, my own book, which I, I refused to publish, I turned it down at the first opportunity because <laughs> you'd have to be mad to want to publish it. Uh, it's published by a very small publisher similar to mine. We finished writing the manuscript in, I think it was February, and we published it for the London Book Fair in the end of March. And there's no reason why not anymore. You can do this, these, these things quickly. So by and large, I publish everything very quickly. My latest book, which I tell you, and this is another bit of utopos um, about good and evil. Um, this is a novelist who I published his first few books, who's everything that a publisher hates. Uh, first of all, he's 60 years old. He's white, he's heterosexual, I think. Um, he's um, middle class or above. Uh, and he never writes the same book twice. Uh, so he doesn't get a fan base. Uh, I keep trying to tell him, but, but he won't listen. Every book is different. So the first book I did with him was about him being asked to help his mother uh, commit suicide, assisted suicide, and it was a true story. And uh, but this one is also a true story, but we had to call it a novel to protect his life, because he he he's, he married very well. He's got a very rich wife, ex-wife now, but she's still very rich. And uh, she she bought him a house in Jamaica. So he lives in Jamaica half the time, and he noticed that around where he lives, the street lights worked, whereas apparently in most of Jamaica, the street lights don't work. So he looked into it a bit, and it turned out that where he lives, there was a bunch of very well healed, very rich, young men. And investigating this further, he discovered that the second biggest export for Jamaica, I think after rum, uh, was the scamming industry. These young men would uh, ring up American millionaires in Florida, typically, and steal money from them by scamming them. The actual version was they'd ring up and say, good news for you, you've won the Jamaican lottery. <laughs> they said, no, we never, I never bought a ticket. Well, it's got your name on it and it's in your town and, um, and we've got your phone number because it was on the ticket. Um, well, well, maybe a friend bought it for you. Maybe, maybe. How much? Oh, a million and a half dollars. Hey. Even for a millionaire, that's quite a lot. Um, so what, what do I have to do? Nothing. You'll get the money. Oh, sorry, one thing. Uh, the Jamaican government taxes it. And so you'll lose half a million. You'll only get a million. Um, but we can arrange for that to be sorted. There's a perfectly above-board legal route. 
it's a little bit administrative, but we'll do the administration. So if you send us $50,000, uh, we can sort it. That's how it sounds. Of course, once they've done that, they're in breach of tax laws in America, and they are susceptible. Scamming. So um, this author gets to meet the head scammer, the person, the man, who runs these things. And the man's got a gun on his desk and says, oh, you're a writer. You can write my story. I'd be delighted if you write my story. I'll tell you what should be in it. And he says, no, no, first of all, I'll write the story. And secondly, could you put the gun away? <laughs> um, and he writes the story. And this is the story of this scammer. But rather like Robert Maxwell, of course scamming is evil. It's a terrible thing, and these poor millionaires are slightly less rich, um, and some of them possibly worse than that. But he was a sort of Robin Hood, this guy. He is a Robin Hood, and has used it to improve the lives of many people in Jamaica. The, uh, the uh, US ambassador to Jamaica, went to see the Prime Minister at one stage and said, can you stop your people scamming us? <laughs> and the Prime Minister said, well, we're a very poor country. Um, you know, this is very valuable to our country, so if you could make good the money, then and of course they couldn't. So anyway, it's moved on since then, but I don't know whether this book will ever make me any money. Uh, but it won't lose me any money, and it's a tale worth telling, and it is to do with good and evil in, in an individual, and I'm sort of proud of it in a way. Um, we published it in a month of it coming in. So then, I think my time is coming up. Um, in, in summary, we've weathered many storms, online streaming, digital piracy, and we will weather many more, and I think artificial intelligence will be stormy. Um, but in a world of mega technology companies, typically owned and managed by mega megalomaniacs, and I'm sure you can think of all the people who are, our industry publishing offers a more diverse and I would argue responsible alternative ecosystem. Most publishing companies, even the very biggest, are minnow, minnows compared with these people. And it's very hard to stop minnows. So whilst one lot may go out, another lot will come up. There's a constant refreshing. Now, we have no right to exist, but we live by our wits. We do, by and large, do no evil, unlike some mega technology companies. Of course, sometimes we make a mistake, but we don't mean to. We're menschlich. We, uh, we're imperfect. But by and large, do no evil. Uh, by and large, stay in business. Or if we don't stay in business, we sell up to someone else. So the books continue. Uh, the authors are still represented around the world. Um, it's not a highly profitable industry, never has been, and never will be, because more people want to be in it than it can support, more people want to be published than it can support, and fewer people want to pay enough money or in enough quantity to, to pay the bills, but nonetheless, we, we, we can stay in business. And we, we stay in business for the right reasons, I think. So in my 50 odd years, talking about maligning people, I didn't really feel I had to malign anyone because by and large, everyone I've dealt with, with one or two exceptions, has been decent, upright, and wanting to do the best in an imperfect world. So I don't, I'm still back to utopos, what does it mean? 
and what does it mean in the context of publishing? I think it means that the dystopian future that some people will predict, and indeed I could paint a picture, won't actually happen. The utopian one, where everyone who wants to be published will be published and everyone will be rewarded and it will be terrific, equally won't happen. But that with goodwill, um, good fighting, and the fighting, there are two main fights we have. The first is to protect copyright, again, again partly against governments and partly against technology companies, and the freedom of expression, again, mainly governments, but with a little bit of technology company coming into the mix at the moment as well. So, um, I don't know. I'll take any questions, but I, all I can say is I've had a most marvelous career, and, I, and being an author has mm -hmm. topped it. Um, I never would have thought that I would end up in the place where I didn't play Iago, um, <laughs> talking to a, to a an audience of highly intelligent and nice people. So thank you all very much for listening. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Richard. I think I'll pass on the microphone for some questions. I silenced everyone. I happen to know that Madalena has some really nasty questions for me, but I suspect you might have an even nastier one. Shut them all up. Madalena, start the ball rolling. <laughs> This actually doesn't belong to that list oh, right, that I've right. sent you. <laughs> okay. But um, I was, you, you were talking about um, institutions losing credibility lately because, because I mean, universities publishing uh, essays or, or journals that lately, that after that became yeah. revealed that they weren't as accurate as they were. Um, and I, f I find it funny the fact that a publisher's credibility is a bit different from an institution's credibility. So like publishing a bad book isn't probably the end of, of a publisher. Would you agree on that or? Um, no, publishing a bad book, I mean, we can get away with publishing many bad books and we, we have done, of course, including me. Um, publishing one. But if you publish bad books overall, sooner or later, you will go out of business. <laughs> it may take a little bit longer. But, but seriously, on the, on the scientific side, where, where this is really happening, uh, partly because of AI, uh, where uh, someone in a, let's imagine, in a distant provincial Chinese university writes up some research, Auto, it's automatically translated into English, it's submitted to a, a, an American journal, and as far as they know, it looks okay, they publish it, and then it turns out it's nonsense. And this has happened, and indeed to very distinguished publishing houses, Cambridge University Press, who had a problem, but you can have one problem at a time, but there was one company that was purchased by John Wiley for $450 million, and it turns out it was rubbish. And uh, most of the paper, many of the papers, were um, inappropriate in one way or another. And John Wiley's share price has come <laughs> way down. I mean, I think they'll survive but they'll be very much more careful in the future than they should be. Um, so I don't, I mean, institutions also, I mean, Oxford, 
I'm sure, has published some... Uh, scholars at Oxford have published bad books, and I think scholars at Oxford, scientists at Oxford, may well have published some not quite as good as it should be research papers. But, you know, you can survive a bit. But not too much. I think there's something between the two. Perfection is not achievable. Mm. That's, uh, that's true. But um, we... I mean, the, the back to, to the AI thing. Of course, AI can generate new material. AI can also identify fake material. So um, it may be that it's the tool that enables us to stop some of this bad stuff happening as well as causing it. Mm. It's strange. It's just, just like the technology companies. They're a tool for good and a tool for bad. That's the problem. Hi, um, uh, I run a publishing house here in Portugal, and I've been debating with um, a question. For now, it's just um, an ethical question, but it might be a real problem in the short term. Yeah. Uh, as you know, uh, we have well, the, the industry has ghostwriting, a lot of ghostwriting. As, sorry, ghostwriting. What? Yeah. Um, and. At least my publishing house, or the one that I run, not mine, unfortunately, but the one that I run, yeah. um, has published uh, sequels of books from dead, auth dead authors, for instance, Agatha Christie or, um, or Enid Blyton. So we go on publishing books from the Twins series. Um, my question is, um, but we pay an author to do that, and actually the name of the author is printed on the cover, but I could probably do very well by using AI to publish these sequels because the, the narrative and the structure, it obeys a certain logic, yep. and it could be very well actually faster, more agile, probably yep. even, you could argue, better written, more accurate, yep. more... Yep. Uh, so should we do it, or should we not do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't do it, someone else will. <laughs> That's not a reason to do it, but it's certainly the case. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, uh, but again, if it's possible to create as good a thing for the reader, for the child, um, why wouldn't you? I'm afraid is my pragmatic response. Um, but one thing I didn't touch on, and I, I did sort of mean to, I, I don't know whether this is not quite in the same area, but one of the worst things that happened last year in Britain was Penguin, in my view. Penguin decided to issue new editions of Roald Dahl's books, Bowdlerized. I think that is shameful. Absolutely shameful, and they should, they should be ashamed of themselves. I see they've now decided to issue classic editions of Roald Dahl, which is, you know, just a cop-out. Um, I think if, to create new books using AI is one thing to take an existing author's books and rewrite them without the permission of the author because the author happens to be dead, that <laughs> seems to me utterly. And, but, and it moves into this whole area of freedom of expression and censorship um, and sensitivity reading. Do you do sensitivity reading? Um, no. I mean, the, the problem with sensitivity reading which is where the publisher sends something out to see if it's going to offend people, is that people who want to be sensitivity readers, by definition, are sensitive or hypersensitive <laughs> to the issues. And so it achieves nothing except uh, censorship of some sort or other. Um, and uh, but one of the things that this has led to in many British public British publishing companies is, um, I don't know what they call it, committees 
for controversial books. And books are not getting, so a book that an editor wants to publish and probably has it peer reviewed, and then it ends up at this committee who say, no, it's too sensitive, we won't publish it. It's censorship. Um, and it also is, is, is not good for, I don't think it's good for management um, structures to have people being overridden by other people who know nothing about it. So, um, yeah, uh, difficult. The, once we get into the ethics of all this, it gets really hard, um, which is why another one of my pet hates is KPIs, key performance indicators, because they indicate absolutely nothing except the person who wrote them got a job for writing these key. Uh, and and they're, they're impossible to measure, and they're, they're, they're pointless, and they, they achieve the opposite of what, like, uh, you might have a key performance. So how many books are you going to publish this year? 20, okay. Oh, I've only done 18. I'd better find another two, or I'll fail my KPI test. Yeah, yeah. Um, then there's a lot of that around. Uh, but fortunately, as I said, most publishers are quite small. There are there are very few, very big ones, uh, and they are getting so big that they they they're not publishers. They're logistics hubs, I would say. Questions. I really have silenced you all. <laughs> Sue, you better ask me a question. <laughs> well, basically, the, the question I have is, well, not so much about this, but uh, regarding your work in, in China and your view about China, yeah. which is, what do you think regarding the critical sense of the Chinese youth and the teenagers, etc.? And uh, also, what's their relationship with uh, with books as well? Yeah. Because well, there's been, uh, in, oh, you know, China is complicated, as they say. Uh, I or, know, I know. You know. Or as my as one of my granddaughters told me the other day, the word problematic is the most used word in their, in their Gen Z vocabulary. And what it means is you're wrong and I'm right, so, okay. <laughs> and China is problematic as well. Um, there is an incredible thirst for education there. And thus, books play a significant role. And unfortunately, the government also plays a significant role. So, for instance, recently, um, one of the great um, book markets in China was for home education in studying English. They, and because the schools, by and large, weren't that great at teaching English. They tried, but they weren't that great. So parents would want their kids to go to after-school after lessons, private lessons, and there was a whole market of books to support this. The government didn't like it uh, very much because they couldn't control the curriculum and essentially stopped it. So, and this is the, both the power of China and the, problem, the problematicness of it. Um, on the other hand, there is sometimes value in power. Um, before, I can't remember the date, 1990 something, uh, China was not a signatory of, to the World Trade Organization. They signed Part of, this, of being a member of the World Trade Organization was that you have to sign up to the Berne Copyright Convention, which means you have to believe in apply copyright. 
up to that point, China was the biggest pirate of material in the world by far. The Chinese government's power is such that that ceased almost immediately. So from one point of view, you could say power was a good thing from another point of view, <laughs> not. Um, but the, the market there is, it's very hard to tell what it is because again, the statistics are quite vague, I think, or problematic. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's clearly an important, it's the second biggest market in the world for books, which is quite a lot after the United States. Um, the creativity element, though, I think is rather shackled um, in that it's very hard for novelists, particularly, to write entirely freely. Um, so the, most of the books that are exported from China are, are apolitical, if uh, one, one way or another books on Chinese art or history of Chinese opera, that, that sort of thing, which is perfectly okay, but um, you can't really challenge things um, on economics or politics. That's the way it is. Um, I wish it was different. But we, 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 well, just on that, we did have a choice, and it was one of the worst times of my career, um, was I was president of the International Publishers Association and we had some 50 members, countries, Portugal being one, Germany, France, Spain. There was one country missing, which was China. And it was missing because the statutes of the International Publishers Association, quite rightly, say um, support for copyright and freedom of expression. Um, but China applied for membership and we had a debate, which is a polite way of saying there were a lot of horrible letters flying around mm -hmm. saying it's outrageous, they mustn't be allowed to join the association. And I, we had a big meeting at the Frankfurt Book Fair and every country has a vote and, and it was packed and there was hot air and steam and I don't know what coming out. And everyone was allowed to have their say, and very strong and, and articulate arguments for and against. Um, the against were largely Northern European and Japan. Germany, Italy, and Japan. There was something they had in common. <laughs> I can't quite put my finger on it, but there you are. Um, they, they were against China joining. And most of the emerging economies uh, were for. Um, anyway, there was this debate, and at the end, and I was chairman, and I allowed them all to speak. And at the end of it, I said something like, "Well, everyone's had their say. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Um, am I allowed, as president of the association, to have my say?" And, they, and, um, and my view is that. All things being equal, I think um, it would be good for the association if China were uh, allowed in, because it's better to have conversation than not. And actually the vote was won very clearly that they should be allowed in. I can't remember the number, 60, 30 or something. It was quite... Um, and. After the meet, after this, the vote was counted, I was assaulted by various <laughs> Northern Europeans. And it was horrible. I mean, these were friends saying I'd let the side down and I shouldn't have said, I said, well, but why, you know, what's the point of being president or something if you're not allowed to say what you think? But um, <laughs> there you are. So China's played a big part of my life, <laughs> one way or another. Um, and it's going to play a big part in, for, look, for the world, it's going to play a big part, and we won't do ourselves, in my view, any favours by pretending they don't exist or that we're not going to have dialogue. We have to. And I just hope India doesn't go the same way. <laughs> That's my
my worry. Okay. Oh. Um, hi. This is a bit unrelated to the questions that were put, but I was wondering if you have any thoughts on Substack and there's authors that actually build some of like the plot line with payers, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the platform and what it does for authors, what it does for non-authors that also put their writing out. And I, I'm a home supporter of Substack for, for a couple of reasons. One is anything that, uh, that allows people to express themselves and indeed to set up some mechanisms for collecting money seems to me like uh, that's called publishing and I, I, I can only applaud it. But also that in, in my little mensch publishing company, Turns out the thing I'm really best at is, is not picking the right books or selling them. Or you know, The thing I'm best at is rejecting books. And I reject 99% of everything I get. And I, but it turns out I'm very good at it. And one of the things I suggest to many people, particularly nonfiction, is that what you're writing is not a book and that you do a, you you do better in reaching your audience through Substack than me or anyone else trying to make a book out of it and selling 200 copies, if we're lucky. So um, I, I'm, a, I'm a complete, and, and Substack, like all the other technologies, there it is, it's, it's part of us, and, uh, and so much the better for existing. And I wish there were more Substacks, and I wish there were more ways of writers making money because they don't make much money um, I can't remember what the latest numbers are but you know it's definitely lower than the minimum wage on average for a highly creative intelligent people so yeah go go for it substack <laughs> do you do you agree Absolutely. Right. How are we doing, Evelyn? Yeah. I think um, there'll be time for more questions with a glass of wine that will be good. in hand. So, Richard, thank you so much once again for coming and for giving us a lovely time. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs>